Okay, so chapter two, early River Valley civilizations, we're going to look at four in total, starting off with the city-states in Mesopotamia. This area of the world was known as the Fertile Crescent, fertile because it's capable of producing uh, various agriculture, and it's a crescent because of its shape, this kind of moon-like shape, if you look closely. Now, um, this area was important because the two rivers that flowed through created soil called silt, and this silt made it easier for farmers to grow produce on. However, this area did have three major disadvantages, the first one being unpredictable flooding plus serious dry spells. So even though there are these two great rivers, it was very hard to foresee how much or how little uh, flow they would have. The other big problem is no natural barriers. Right? It's a very bare um, area without any natural type of forests or mountains for protection, so no natural barriers. And finally, limited natural resources. Now, the three solutions the people back then came up with is, for one, the flooding, create an irrigation system. Two, if you don't have natural barriers, create artificial barriers, right? Create brick walls. And finally, three, trade with civilizations nearby to make up for your lack of natural resources in the area, such as stone, wood, and metal. So again, for unpredictable flooding, irrigation. For barriers, you just build walls. And for limited natural resources, you trade. Now, Samaria back then had what we call city-states, and this is an interesting concept because they're very different from cities we, we call today like Paris or New York or San Francisco. These cities are essentially countries themselves. So these cities run on their own, they have their own leader, and it's not like there was a Sumerian government that oversaw everyone. Each of these cities had their own rules, their own laws, you know, their own leaders, and they would sometimes get in wars with each other as well. Some examples include Uruk and Lagash. Uh, during this time, priests were the strongest ones in society. They would run their government as well as their religion from these buildings known as ziggurats. And um, it was not only priests, though. At times, military leaders would jump in. So at times during war, Sometimes you get a guy who is in charge of the military taking over, which makes sense, right? You rather have a guy looking like the rock take over during a time of war than a priest. And often these military leaders would pass their power on to their sons. This was known as a dynasty, when, one, when power continues to get passed on to the next generation. Uh, cultural diffusion occurs during this time, so this is when new ideas or um, items flow from one culture to another. So specifically, we see this happening between Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley Civilization, which we'll cover a few sections later. Now today, we see cultural diffusion at an even greater scale everywhere. So for example, you see an American man here holding a Japanese-made video game. You see someone in Africa carrying bottles of an American uh, company uh, made beverage, Coca-Cola. Here you see a Spanish soccer team, but two uh, players, neither from Spain, one from Argentina, one from Brazil. And you see one of those players now on a video game on it from an American company uh, called EA Sports. And finally, language is a perfect example of cultural diffusion. We see Chinese, and then Chinese gets to Korea. Koreans create their own language, Hangul, and at the same time, uh, the Japanese are also creating their own version based upon Chinese. And of course, the biggest cultural diffusion we see today is perhaps what the English, the British Empire did for us, the spread of the English language. This is why I'm speaking to you in English right now, even though this is a school in Korea. Now, religion was polytheistic. I'll bring this term up over and over when we study religions. Polytheism versus monotheism. Polytheism is when there's multiple gods. The strongest god was Enel, the god of storm and air. 
And the gods of Sumeria were very similar to the gods of the Romans and Greeks. And what I mean by this is they had very man-like personalities. They'd constantly get involved in personal affairs with people. They get jealous. They sometimes even just kill people. They have affairs with human beings. They even have babies with human beings. And um, this type of way of looking at gods uh, made humans back then believe that sacrifices were necessary to keep the gods happy. Furthermore, an interesting difference from you know, the major religions today, whether it be Judaism, Christian, or Islam, is that people back then did not believe in heaven after life. They believed once you died, you went to the land of no return. Now, when it came to science, the Sumerians invented the wheel, which has unbelievably positive long-term effects. We still use it today, right? rather it be a bicycle or cars. They developed a number system from 1 to 60, and they developed one of the earliest known writing systems known as cuneiform. And uh, here is their numbering system. As you can see, it goes from 1 to 60. Now, throughout 2000 to 3000 BC, this is constant bickering and fighting among these various city-states in the area of Sumeria. It's not until 2350 BC where one man, Sargon, is able to defeat all the city-states in Sumer and create the world's first empire. So an empire is when you bring together people from different areas, different nations, and you bring them all under control of one so this very first empire of Sargon looks something like this. Moving on. So following the um, Sargon's empire, there was another empire built by the Babylonians. So they were nomadic warriors. So nomadic means they weren't settled in one place. They took over that area. And perhaps their most famous ruler was Hammurabi, who was in charge around 1800 BC during the empire's peak. Hammurabi is probably most well known for what is known as the Hammurabi's Code, which is a set of laws he created, 282 in total. And uh, this is a key point here. The laws differ depending on your social class and gender. So what that means is the law is not equally applied to everyone. So depending on who you are, you may have easier, more lenient sentences or more strict sentences. And here's a few examples. So if one steals the property of a temple or of the court, he shall be put to death. And also the one who receives a stolen thing from him shall be put to death. And this is probably the most famous one. If a man puts out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. In other words, an eye for an eye. So these were very strict rules, um, but they were, uh, were very straightforward, especially as you can see with the eye for an eye. And... Um, this was an incredibly important part of history because it was one of the first set of codified laws uh, mankind had ever seen. So that concludes section one. Uh, we'll move on to the next major river civilization next class. Have an excellent day. Goodbye.